Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. Hello, and welcome to the latest episode of Masters of Carpentry. I am your host, Alex. To my left is my co-host, Julia. Hello. And over here we have my co-host, Noel. Hello. And with us, a special guest. You know him, you love him, Kevin O'Shea. Julia, do the thing. What? <laughs> Of course, now it's not funny if I have to explain it, <laughs> as is the entirety of my life's existence. So, hi! <laughs> you are still the Kurt Russell of our show. You are back yet again. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yes, we are here to cover John Carpenter's The Thing. Not just The Thing. John Carpenter's The Thing. Yes. I think this was actually maybe the start of when that happened, because then you suddenly got John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, John Carpenter's They Live. John Carpenter's The Thing is just, you can't say The Thing without saying John Carpenter's The Thing. <laughs> Clive Barker's John Carpenter's The Thing. <laughs> I'm surprised those two actually never work together. Actually, maybe I, yeah. <laughs> They'd have a name clash in the title. It's true. <laughs> Clive Carpenter's. <laughs> That's kind of the thing when somebody becomes more of a franchise of himself, because then you've got like Tom Clancy's, etc., James Patterson's, etc., which is actually interesting because a lot of the Tom Clancy's and James Patterson's stuff is actually not written by them anymore. Or like the 30 years where it was Stan Lee Presents Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. He's brand naming himself. Yeah. Which at this point in his life is kind of par for the course. And then it's interesting, though, that he branded himself with this and then instantly jumped over to Starman, which is so completely outside of his brand. <laughs> John Carpenter's Starman. Let me just go ahead and jump into just some quick things here, and then we can just talk for a second about how this film actually performed. So the thing was released on June 25th, 1982. While Halloween 2 marked Carpenter's first collaboration with Universal, this was actually his directorial debut with the studio. The screenplay was written by Bill Lancaster, the son of legendary movie star Burt Lancaster. Bill's only other produced writing credits are the original Bad News Bears and that series' third installment, The Bad News Bears Go to Japan. He didn't write part two, but he came back for part three. Lancaster and Carpenter were signed to do an adaptation of Stephen King's Firestarter immediately following this, but as we'll get into, the thing did not do well, so they were yanked off that project. I do have a copy of their draft, and we'll be covering it on John Ockerfer in the future. Sadly, Bill Lancaster passed away in 1997 at the age of 50. Deborah Hill was not involved in this film. Larry Franco is just one film away from becoming Carpenter's main producing partner and here again acts as associate producer and first assistant director. The producers were David Foster and Lawrence Terman, who had made several attempts over a few years to get the project off the ground. Before Carpenter, Toby Hooper was signed on to direct with a script by William F. Nolan, a sci-fi author best known for writing the Logan's Run series. Foster and Terman have continued producing with works including The River Wild and the Short Circuit Duology, and Foster also worked on Mask of Zorro. Foster again worked with Carpenter on the Fog remake, and both Foster and Terman return as executive producers on the 2011 prequel Thing film, which again, I will also be covering on a future John Aquafa. Much of the film was shot on the Universal Studios lot in Los Angeles, actually using refrigerated sets. But exteriors were filmed in British Columbia, and a full-sized recreation of the main outpost was built on an abandoned mine on a glacier in Alaska. The budget was $15 million, which surprised me. I actually thought it was going to be a little higher than that, though it only pulled in a box office of $19.5 million. This is one of those films where you listen to the commentary, and the DVD has this great 80-minute long documentary on the making of the film where they talk to everyone involved in it. Everyone had a blast making this movie. It was a tough shoot just because of the locations and because of the complex puppet effects, but the cast and crew really treated it like an adventure and they really bonded over it and they got to have fun and play around with it. Rob Bottin did the creature effects. He was just in his early 20s at the time. This was his first major film as a creature effects supervisor and they basically just let him cut loose and experiment. The studio was fully behind Carpenter, pretty much gave him a lot of freedom and control on this, gave him full support, a big ad boost and all that stuff. And when the film came out, it came out two weeks after E.T. 
Hmm. And nobody wanted to go see the thing because they were all busy seeing E.T. again and again and again. He's a nicer alien. And the critics tore the movie to shreds as disgusting and gross. One of the main quotes called Carpenter a pornographer of violence, which was a label that stuck with him for years. This film was shredded. And between this and Halloween 3, which we'll be covering in the next episode, Carpenter's time with Universal was very short-lived. He did ultimately come back and do a few more films with them, but this was a very significant blow, which was sad because he was so proud of it and everybody had so much fun making it. And you can tell. You can usually tell when the cast oh, yeah. is having fun making a movie as opposed to just showing up and getting a paycheck. Oh, yeah. Because they're really getting into it. The effects and everything, as usually is the case with in-camera effects that are done well, they hold up. Yes. Puppetry does not hold up as well over the ages, but this really, really does. Yeah. I credit a lot of that also to the great lighting and cinematography by Dean Cundey, who, again, he had done Halloween, Fog, Escape from New York, and he was just about to end his tenure with Carpenter and become the main cinematographer of Steven Spielberg. And you can see a lot of that same eye from this film to those Spielberg films in the late 80s, early 90s. And not to get too much into the discussion of the film right away, but if you look at the actual puppets, they are very crude and very obviously just rubber with a lot of seams all stuff. And he just lit the hell out of them and just shot them so beautifully. They are still also very imaginative sculpts. But again, I think we're kind of jumping ahead in the discussion. But yeah, no, it's a film that everyone poured their hearts into. Literally, in some of these cases, because, oh my god, that dripping goo. <laughs> Which was actually the substance that's used to make the cream in Twinkies. Mm -hmm. During this shoot, they went from that to KY Jelly because that other stuff became too expensive. I remember one guy in the documentary <laughs> said they walked in and they just had five-gallon jugs all lined up against the wall of KY Jelly. And it's like, I didn't know you could buy that much KY Jelly. <laughs> you can. George Takei has left Amazon comments on them. Good to know. <laughs> <laughs> So, but yeah, it was one of those films where everyone really gave it their all and it just dropped in the middle of the woods and nobody cared. And then it also had the misfortune of coming out within two months of suddenly everyone in the media knowing what AIDS is. AIDS had been around for a while, but that's when it had the spotlight on it. And here you have a film about an infectious disease and blood tests and it all went bad. Everything leading up to the release of this film was spectacular. The release of this film, it all just went as wrong as you could hope to avoid. Returning from past installments, we have actor Kurt Russell. We have actor Adrian Barbeau as the voice of the chess computer that McCready calls a cheating bitch. I should add that she and Carpenter were just two years away from divorcing at the time, and I'm not sure if this is an early sign of why. We also have cinematographer Dean Cundy, camera operator Ray Stella, first assistant camera Clyde e. Bryan, second assistant camera Steve Tate, editor Todd Ramsey, special effects supervisor Roy Arbogast, special effects technician Gary Zink, matte painter Jim Danforth, musician Alan Howarth, second assistant director Jeffrey Chernow, makeup artist Kenneth Chase, stunt coordinator Dick Warlock, grips Laszlo Horvath and Ronald Woodward, gaffers Thomas Marshall and Mark Walther, electrician Jan Antunovich, Foley supervisor John K. Adams, sound mixers Tommy Kazi, Bill Varney, and Steve Maslow, sound editors Warren Hamilton Jr. and David Udall, and boom operator Joe Brennan. Returning for the last time, this is the last of two films that Rob Bottin will do the creature effects for, which John Carpenter previously worked on The Fog. After this, he went on to do Explorers, Legend, Inner Space, Robocop, Total Recall, Seven, Mimic, Fight Club, and most recently did some work on Game of Thrones. This is the last of three films for sound mixer Greg Landeker and electrician Terry Marshall. This is the last of four films for matte painter Bill Taylor, the guy who wrote Benson, Arizona for Dark Star. And this is the last of five films for assistant camera Douglas Olivares. Showing up for the first time, we have actor Wilford Brimley, who will return in the Carpenter-written television movie Blood River, which I hope we can do an episode on. The only source I had for it online has disappeared. And I'm hoping to find it again before we get to it. If I don't find it, that will be the only thing that we are skipping in this series. We have actor Keith David, who will infamously return in They Live. God, he looks so young in this, too. I know. And I love Keith David in pretty much every single thing he does. I mean, freaking Goliath. I still need to watch Gargoyles. Yes, you do. I can loan you my DVDs if you want. Let's see, 56. So he would have been just in his 20s at the time. Man. And just such a distinctive voice, too. I'm glad he's gone on to have just a killer career, both in voice acting and on-camera acting. Mm-hmm. 
Also, for the first time, we have stunt performer Eric Mansker will return in They Live in El Diablo. Second assistant cameraman David Geddes will return as the cinematographer on Halloween 8 Resurrection. Set decorator Graham Murray will return as the production designer of the Fog remake. Sound effects assistant John Post will return as the sound editor on Christine and a Foley artist on the Philadelphia Experiment, Black Moon Rising, and Halloween 5. Sound editor Ken Sweet will return as dialogue editor on Halloween 3 and Christine. Though Rob Bottin didn't return, members of his Creature Effects crew, Dale Brady, Ken Diaz, and James Cagle, will also do Big Trouble in Little China, along with production designer John Lloyd. And when Rob Bottin fell behind, legendary Creature Effects master Stan Winston stepped in to do the Dog Monster puppet, and he will return again on Starman. Got just a few more random trivia names here. Ennio Morricone continues to be a wildly prolific Italian composer, a multiple Oscar nominee with one win, and is arguably best known for his scores to the Sergio Leone classic spaghetti westerns, like Fistful of Dollars and Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Once Upon a Time in the West. His score for this film was allegedly chopped down and reworked by Carpenter, which Morricone was not pleased with, and apparently like took to the Italian media and tore the film apart because of that. Two-time Academy Award-winning visual effects supervisor Albert Whitlock is a legendary matte artist with a career spanning 60 years before his death in 1999. He did paintings and effects for most of Hitchcock's studio films, including The Birds, Marnie, Torn Curtain, Topaz, and Frenzy. Other works include Robinson Crusoe on Mars, which I just watched for the first time, and Alex, you were looking for classic sci-fi recommends. I highly recommend it. Awesome. Funny Girl, Funny Lady, Colossus the Forbin Project, The Andromeda Strain, Diamonds Are Forever, Slaughterhouse Five, The Sting, Earthquake, The Man Who Would Be King, The Hindenburg, Exorcist Two: The Heretic, High Anxiety, The Wiz, History of the World Part One, Graystroke, The Legend of Tarzan, Dune, Red Sonja, Clue, Spaceballs, and Chaplin as well as tons of paintings for the original Star Trek TV series. I should also point out, I didn't write this down, but as I was going through the credits, a lot of the crew on this were just these old, like, 50, 60-year-old Universal Studios veterans. Like, the art director of this was the art director for the entirety of the Monsters TV series. Hmm. The uh, production designer was the production designer for the entirety of the Leave it to Beaver TV series. It's just all these guys came out of classic TV, then in the 70s moved on to films, and then somehow ended up here. And this was actually like the last film a lot of them did before they started retiring and passing on. Finally, the creature sequences were co-designed and storyboarded by Mike Plug. After working as a layout artist for Hanna-Barbera on Wacky Races, Plug went on to Marvel Comics, where he co-created and drew Ghost Rider, the demon-possessed stunt driver version, not the Western hero, and also worked on the Monster of Frankenstein, Man-Thing, and Werewolf by Night. Though he still does the rare comic from time to time, after leaving Marvel, he went into films through Ralph Bakshi on Wizard and Lord of the Rings, and also worked as a design illustrator and or storyboard artist on Heavy Metal, Dark Crystal, Superman 3, Supergirl, Black Cauldron, Return to Oz, Young Sherlock Holmes, Little Shop of Horrors, Moonwalker, The Witches, Titan AE, Singer's first X-Men film, and Shrek. So why don't we just pause for a moment and just, what is everyone's individual history with this film? This film kicked off my fascination with John Carpenter. I read about it actually in a book called Morvern Caller, which is about a young Scottish woman who uh, finds her boyfriend has committed suicide. So she does what anyone would do and steals his unfinished manuscript and hands it in to get the cash for herself for a book he wrote. It's a good book. Anyways, she's pop culture obsessed, and she mentions trying to track down in Scotland a copy of John Carpenter's The Thing, so I immediately went out to find my own copy of John Carpenter's The Thing. I found one VHS cassette in the back of a uh, video store in my former city of Toronto, and the rest is history. So she had a thing, so you needed the thing so you could do the thing. And I got the thing. Julia, have you seen this movie before? I've apparently seen it three times. Oh. <laughs> uh, I have uh, both a wonderful gift and curse of a really bad memory. Therefore, I get to watch movies for the first time numerous times. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first time all over again. It is. So is this the third time I've seen it or is it the fourth? I think this is the third or fourth. Fourth, I don't know. You're married to me, so you've seen it a few times. I would say it's probably the fourth. And every time I've seen it is with Alex, and Alex was the one who introduced it to me. Hmm. Kevin. Well, that's kind of an interesting story, and I'll, I'll shorten it. Oh, please, no. Prolong the amount of time that I don't have to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Back when I was in my late teens, I had a friend who was getting me into 
classic horror classic movies because at the time we were going to go into business together and make a production company make horror movies of our own. And I hadn't really been all that into horror before, so he actually had three John Carpenter movies that he made me watch. This was one of them, and the other two was John Carpenter's Prince of Darkness, mm -hmm. and then, of course, Assault on Precinct 13, which you and I have gone at length about, and In you guys past, have had yes. your own episode about that. I hate love remakes. Blogspot.com. <laughs> <laughs> Which to this day, I still consider to be, if you're going to be doing film study or if you want to make movies and you can only watch one movie before you get started, that's the movie to watch. Oh, yeah. But this was one of them. So I had seen this about, God, 10, 11 years ago and have not seen it since, but it definitely still holds up. And I, God, when did I first see this? I was probably around 13 or so when I first saw it. I think... Oh, I saw this, Escape from New York, and Halloween in very close succession. I think also Assault on Precinct 13 and Dark Star around that time. I can't remember which one was my first. I think this might have been my first because it was someone who wasn't my dad showed it to me. And then my dad suddenly is like, oh, you like John Carpenter, do you? Here you go. And showed me a whole bunch of the others. This film kind of changed me. I hated horror movies. I was terrified of horror movies. I was very squeamish around gore and violence in movies. And this turned me into that dark kid who's drawing monsters tearing themselves open as teeth rip out in all of my school notebooks for like the rest of my junior high and high school life. And actually kind of started my fascination with horror. I think it was through this that I started checking out stuff like Lovecraft and other various horror franchises like Elm Street and Hellraiser. And I started reading Clive Barker. And this just kind of like opened up my mind in terms of like how you could present horror, what can horrify just the concept of the thing itself and the presentation of the thing itself. And so this is one of those essential films for me in terms of my development as a human being, which is probably not a good thing to say, <laughs> but there you go. It explains a lot. It explains so much. <laughs> so much. And I mean that lovingly. See, and the thing is, it also scared the shit out of me when I first saw it, because I was also extremely sensitive to Invasion of the Body Snatcher type movies. In fact, it was one of the remakes of Body Snatchers I saw as a kid. I didn't sleep for two days and was afraid that my mom was a pod person. <laughs> so this tapped into that while also luring me in with all the creature designs and all that stuff. And it blew my mind. And even then, I was appreciating the way it was shot, the way it was lit, the way it was cut together. It was just so spectacularly well made. And this was right near the beginning as I started to become fascinated with how films were made. And I want to say within like two years of this, I was starting to collect screenplays. And DVDs were just starting to hit. So I was starting to get really into like commentaries and behind the scenes things. And this was one of those films where I'm like, I need to know how they made that. So it's been a deeply passionate film for me. And I've seen it. I want to say it's probably been about three years since I last seen it, but I've probably seen it a dozen times by now. There used to be a year where I'd watch it like every month and then I would watch it like every few months, then maybe twice a year and then once a year and then once every other year. So it was nice to dust it off again. It's one of my essentials and one of the reasons I love Carpenter, one of the reasons I was excited about doing this project. It's actually fun that we're doing this now because we actually have a friend who's out at McMurdo Station. I was going to mention Cat too, yeah. Yeah, which is really, really freaking cool. How long mm -hmm. has she been out there? It's been a few months now. Since October, I think. I think she's probably been there about six months. Cat, we dedicate this episode to you. <laughs> Wish you continued safe adventures, don't use thermite on the spaceship, and may you return safe and warm. <laughs> God, how do we know these people on the line? Isn't that amazing? Through me, actually. <laughs> yes, no. Everyone I know is through Made of Phil. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you were also one of the key changing pinnacle moments of my life, Kevin. <laughs> Not as much as this movie, though. Uh, well, this movie actually probably drove me into isolation. It was why I didn't talk to anyone until Made of Phil came around. <laughs> So we drove you out of isolation. Yes, thank you. Okay, so basically I reversed everything that this movie did to you. I came up with all these things in my head that scared everyone else away until I found a community where they were like, hey, that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Which just goes to show there's always people like you somewhere. Yes. Now, seriously, I can't tell you how many times I was sent to the counselor at school because everyone was concerned. <laughs> I'm like, it's just a cool drawing. Come on. I still actually abhor real life violence. I can't stand it. But it's like ever since I learned how films are made, I become fascinated about how they bring reactions out of people. See, I used to be friends with those guys in high school. And so I, I know exactly where you're coming from. Yeah. 
See, and I'm not even like into the super gory stuff either. Like I'm not into Hostel or the Saw movies, but I like how you can use it as an art, an art to get a specific timed reaction out of somebody. And it, the way the puppets and everything in this movie, it really is artistic. It's kind mm -hmm. of beautiful in its entirely grotesque, horrific, gooey and it's not just shock. There are deeper layers to it. I don't think there's any more than two jump scares in the entire movie. And one of them just involves a dog being thrown out a door. Yeah. The rest <laughs> of it is just the slow and natural buildup of everything, which yeah. is great. And it's my favorite part of horror. So we're starting to get into discussion here. Let me burn through the synopsis real quick here, and then we'll go <laughs> ahead and, and roll into open discussion. Boy, I wonder if any of us are going to recommend this movie. <laughs> An American outpost in Antarctica is surprised to find themselves visited by a Norwegian helicopter carrying a man with a rifle chasing after a dog. When his gunfire starts hitting the Americans, they have no choice but to retaliate, shooting him down. They take in the dog while trying to piece together what's going on, with helicopter pilot McCready taking a flight back to the Norwegian camp and finding it a burned-out wreck with dead bodies and some mangled thing in a fire pit outside. Carting the carcass back, it's dug into by biologist Blair as they learn the Norwegians dug up some kind of alien craft and its occupant in the ice. When the dog is put in a kennel that night, it splits open into a violently shape-shifting monstrosity as it tries to absorb and create imitations of the other dogs. It's torched with a flamethrower before it can finish, but Blair realizes the implications of such a creature and starts wrecking the transportation and radios around camp before the others lock him away. They know he's right, though, as paranoia starts to spread about whether or not there's an alien imitation in their midst. Meteorologist Bennings is the first to go when it's discovered too late the original carcass isn't entirely dead. Then Norris has a heart attack, only to burst into a thing when he's zapped by a defibrillator and kills Dr. Copper. Boy, that's an elaborate scene that I just rolled through in one line. <laughs> <laughs> Ever, a lot of scenes are like that. <laughs> yeah. Nobody trusts anybody with suspicion thrown on Commander Gary over destroyed blood stores and Clark over his supervision of the dogs. And even McCready is implicated when torn underwear with his name on them is found, with Mechanic Childs being the main opposition for leadership. Based on his observations of Norris's transformation, McCready realizes every tiny piece of this thing is a distinct organism which will respond independently, so with dynamite and a flamethrower in hand, he forces the others to be tied down and draws blood, poking at each dish with a heated needle. The other pilot, Palmer, is revealed as a thing, killing radio technician Windows before he's put down. All that's left are McCready, Childs, Gary, and the Cook Nalls, and they set out to test Blair, only to find him missing and there's a slapped-together flying saucer in the basement under his shack. With Childs now also missing and the generator taken out, the others decide to blow up and burn down the rest of the camp, luring the Blair thing into a massive explosion. McCready is the only one who makes it out as he stumbles through the wreckage of the camp, waiting to freeze to death, only for Childs to appear. Neither knows if the other is human, and there's not much they can do about it if one isn't, so they just share a look and await their fates. Alex, do you recommend The Thing? We have gone over, with a fine-toothed comb, every Carpenter film leading up to this moment. Oh boy, and have I we? went in, yes with mixed and trepidatious feelings over what I would discover when I dug deep and analyzed the hell out of the thing. And what I found wrong about this film was nothing. <laughs> it's a masterpiece. A tense, hard-as-nails masterpiece that in my mind does not put a foot wrong. I have a friend who's a makeup effects artist who uh, apprenticed under the dude who created the Mystique makeup for the first X-Men film. Mm. And she is the head effects makeup artist for a theme park in Canada called Canada's Wonderland. And I showed this film to her for the first time, and it's sort of like a Bible for her now. Oh, wow. What you were saying before about creature effects, it seems like even though some of the models aren't amazing, it's basically liquid plus lighting equals incredible effects. And the acting is just spot on perfect. No one is grandstanding. Everyone is committed. Everyone is, it's a perfect ensemble cast. Kurt Russell, who is a bona fide star, blends in perfectly with the team in one of his most understated performances yet. Every action makes sense. Every time they try to fight someone, people are stumbling. It's realistic. There's no, like, clear action sequence that would make it staged or, like, uh, oh, what's the Now word? is the time to fight. Now is the time to fight, <laughs> yeah. I cannot say enough good things about the thing. It's a masterpiece. Highly recommend it. Julia, do you recommend the thing? I do recommend the thing. I think it's well scary. <laughs> 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 I 
every time I see it, because I forget. She right? forgets, and every time that damn defibrillator scene and the blood sample scene comes up, her head explodes. Speaking of friends, we have another friend who, when we go to the movies with, she's a screamer, you know, like a gasper, <laughs> a clinger, an oh my god, uh, that sort of thing. And I always just kind of scoff and roll my eyes at her like, ugh, <laughs> did you see w- that coming? <laughs> Julia's way tougher than I am oh, in movies. Way tougher. I have a hide behind her back. And But every time I see this movie, I guess I forget. Oh. Every single yeah. time. And I'm just like, ugh. <laughs> it's just like a sustained violin note. It's just like, <laughs> for the whole movie it just gets under your skin (laughs) yeah it's got great tension i really like how real it is yes i really like how natural it is i love the pacing because i do like my movies a little slower Mm -hmm. i like the music in it i thought the effects were great i thought the acting was great i was a little bit sad that they were all men but you can't have everything (laughs) but i liked that they looked like real men that it wasn't just a bunch of hunks hanging out a bunch of ugly (laughs) bastards it was a bunch of ugly bastards and i liked them all (laughs) but it was nice to see real men and and actual different characters, even though they didn't have too much of a monologue describing their past or anything, but you got to know who each character was. You knew how they would kind of react to something and without having to know too much about them. And I thought it was a really smart story, and I highly recommend it. There was actually some talk about whether or not to make some of the characters female. And Carpenter ultimately decided he just thought it would give an interesting atmosphere if it was all just testosterone. Hmm. And he never wanted any of the tension to be undercut with the sexual tension or... Actually, that'll be interesting to re-explore when we get to the Thing prequel where they actually do bring some women in. But that was actually something that they did consider. So, Kevin. Well, like I said, this is one of the movies that he showed me as movies done right. And it worked. It absolutely did. As Julia said, the pacing is perfect. The characterization, especially since you only get those first few minutes with them before the conflict hits, the fact that you still get a good sense of who's who and what they're all about is really something to keep in mind for writing bit characters, people who you don't see all that much, but you want them to be memorable and unique without being like, that's the guy who does this, and that's the guy who is this. It's understated, and it totally comes across This movie is one of those movies that I will put aside and show people this is how movies are supposed to be made if you're going to have this kind of feel to them, and I will absolutely recommend it to anybody. I also highly recommend the movie. I do actually have a criticism against it, and that's just that I find the final confrontation with the Blair monster underwhelming. But as I'll get to in my talk of the early draft of the script, they had to scrap the entire third act that they were planning on and had to just kind of build this new one out of scratch. And even then, it still has some great sequences. Like, I just love that Nalls just disappears or the whole, let's just shove your hand in Gary's face. Everyone was so in sync on this movie. Everyone was so lined up on this movie that even when they just had to completely make up the final conflict out of nothing, they still all threw something really neat together. This is just a film where it's like everyone brought their A-game, everyone excelled, and everyone meshed together. I mean, you guys have brought up the realism. It's also a very stylish movie in the way that it's shot and composed and edited and lit. But it's like it uses the stylish stuff to shoot things that are played very realistic. And it's that perfect mesh of it's not a fully realistic movie. It's not a fully stylish movie. It's a harmonious fusion of the two, which has always been one of my favorite things of Carpenter. Everyone's very down to earth and real, but it's also very slick and clean. I just, God, just that dun 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 pulse of the music, the creature designs, the cast. So many of these actors I've been fond of over the years just because of this movie. It's just so tightly written. It's a smart movie, too. Everything has a reason. Everything falls perfectly into sync. But it all feels natural. It doesn't feel like some falsely constructed plot. And then that ending, just that absolute nihilistic ending of, we're dead, not much we can do about it, so let's just welcome it as it comes. My God, this movie. It's just such an experience. Can I just say something that my absolute favorite part of the way that this was written, the way this was presented, Mm -hmm. is you don't have that on the nose, oh, the audience knows that this person is the monster in disguise, and we're watching as this person doesn't know, but we know, and so it's more tense that way. No, it takes that whole aspect of we don't know what's going on either. 
we're fumbling around in the dark just as much as Kurt Russell is, and we don't even know that Kurt Russell isn't infected for a good deal of the movie either. You don't know that he's not infected at the very end. Yeah, just the fact that we're in the dark just as much as every single other character is, Mm -hmm. it heightens attention. It's not that, oh, we know something that the main character doesn't know. Which is something that I don't see all that often. And that was what was neat about the commentary was Kurt Russell said it was always just so damn frustrating because we even got into these debates of if you're a thing, would you even know that you're the thing? Which in the original short story, no, you wouldn't. In the original novella, they didn't know that they were the thing. I would argue that they still don't because when that guy was having chest pains, oh, yeah. he clearly doesn't seem to know what's going on. Oh, yeah, I know. And, and that is like a huge building of that idea right there is he constructed this guy's heart so perfectly that it even has the flaws. And yep. he's still succumbing to them as though he was real. And even as they're talking about it in the commentary, Kurt Russell's like, damn it, you're getting me frustrated again. <laughs> <laughs> God, Kurt Russell laughed his ass off for half the commentary. <laughs> but it was great. They never tip their hand. They never tip their hand. Whenever the thing is revealed, it always seems to be in shock that it's revealed. Like the mouth is agape, its eyes are wide. It's just a perfect facsimile. It fakes you out a lot, though. I mean, Clark is played as a total red herring. And then you have the whole bit with the blood where it's either the doctor or it's Gary. It's got to be one of them. Who is it? And it's neither one. Nope. Neither one of them at all. This film is a master of psychouts, and it's a master of knowing what you're suspecting and not giving you what you're suspecting, not giving you any of the possibilities you're expecting, as suddenly that guy's the thing now. The, the blood is the other jump scare of the movie, and like I'm not a big fan of the jump scares, but the fact that the entire first part of the movie is this slow build up to the dreadful realization, and it was doing that exact same slow build up to the dreadful resolution as far as the blood goes. And then it cut it like super early. Mm -hmm. That was masterful. That's a jump scare done right. Not just, oh, something's coming, bam. And you also look at the build of that scene. The first two Petri dishes he does, he leaves them sitting on the table. But then because nothing's happening, he's becoming more comfortable with the Petri dish. So he starts picking it up in his hand. And even the first one that he does, the doctor, where or I think it was Clark, where it turns out to be nothing, he's using the dummy hand. He's using the dummy hand and still nothing happens. But you're used to that hand now and he's used to holding it up near his face and suddenly, boom, Palmer's blood shoots out. And then I love when they resume the test, he's standing as far away from that blood as he can. (laughs) It's a perfectly measured build of tension that's still completely true to character in terms of how he would have gotten more comfortable and closer to that Petri dish. And they cut it early. It's beautiful. There's only a couple of shots where they linger on the creature effects. Otherwise, they give you just enough of a glimpse to burn it in your brain and not long enough of a glimpse for you to stare at it, like especially when the head is separating and stuff like that. Even when Palmer is starting to shift, they cut away. They only let you look at it for a few seconds before cutting away and then suddenly it's different and cut away and then suddenly it's different. It's a really successful film in the way that we all sort of speak a certain language in terms of film that we know of looking for like visual and music cues for our upcoming jump scares or tense scenes or POV shots to show something's up. And this does not use any of those. See, that's what I love. Carpenter mastered those jump scares and those techniques. He mastered those in Precinct 13 and Someone's Watching Me in Halloween. And now he's building on that knowledge by saying, you know what these tricks are. I know these tricks. Let's try to take it a step further and trick you by thinking you're expecting those tricks. I like it. (laughs) I'll get to the differences in the script coming on. But what was neat is all of that script was pretty much here in terms of they didn't really change any dialogue. They didn't really change the way any of the major character dynamics were. But you can still see the actors really brought a lot just in terms of a lot of the little business that they do in terms of who's close to who, who's shifting Mm -hmm. from who. Like, I love the bit when the Bennings thing runs out and falls into the snow and they're running up to kill it. And they basically almost just trip right into it. Yep. I like that aspect a lot. Everyone's sort of clumsy. It's the atmosphere. You're in snow. You're in winter gear. You're not in control of your faculties, really. Like, all your senses are deadened as well. Like, you can't see or hear properly. It's an atmosphere of terror. And none of them are soldiers. No. I mean, with the exception of Gary, who's military. That's why he's the base commander. But they're meteorologists. I mean, Norris, I know from the script, is an oil guy. They're there for scientific exploration. Childs is the mechanic. Palmer and McCready are the pilots, but it's the off season. It's a winter season where they're not supposed to be flying anyways. So they're just hunkering. McCready especially is just hunkering down in his shack. You have Nalls. Nalls is one of the few people who makes it to the third act. And he's just the cook. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's also what I like is that both black guys make it to the last 10 minutes of the movie. And one of them still makes it all the way to the end. That's true. 
Or does he? Yeah. <laughs> it knows what all the tropes are. It knows what all the regular notes are, and it subverts them. It set so many new bars in its wake. Yeah. And it's like all the right people did still see this film when it came out, and it was a hugely influential film. Yeah. And even by the time it hit video, it became a huge bestseller. Why don't we just run through some of the cast? Why don't we just talk about Kurt Russell's McCready? With his sombrero. <laughs> the hat, of course, is the most amazing thing about the movie. <laughs> that makes the character. It's true. I love how he's very much the lead, but he comes out of the ensemble nicely. Very much like Ripley and Alien. Mm -hmm. It's a part of the group who just gradually, the group brings that character to the fore. He's a survivor. I like that he's not this super Snake Plissken, just uber Kurt Russell kind of a character. He's just like an everyman who just has to step up. He's just a guy. The character description in the script was, he hates the cold, but the pay is good. Yeah. And it's like counterintuitive to most other Kurt Russell roles that you would see in this kind of movie where he would be the ex-military guy or the guy that's running from his past or anything. No, he's just a dude. He's mm -hmm. just a dude who's just there. He's not a hero. And he's good at piloting. And it's by sheer happenstance that he's the one who comes up with the blood test just because of the head crab. Because he's a pilot. He notices things. He's got that observation. And he puts two and two together. But he does it in such a way that other people in that situation might also do if they were that observant. Mm -hmm. He also totally kills a guy. Like an innocent guy. <laughs> well, well, he's rushing at him with a knife. He is, yeah, yeah, I'm just saying. So I wouldn't say he killed a guy in cold blood. While McCready's pointing a gun at him and holding a stick of dynamite. <laughs> no, I, I actually really like the murder of Clark in that it's... Realistic. It was a totally avoidable situation, but it was totally realistic and totally understandable. You can understand why McCready reacted the way he did. You can understand why Clark reacted the way he did. And you can understand what the circumstances are that led them there. You can understand why everyone is so suspicious of Clark. And yet you can also understand why Clark is pissed. Because also, nobody probably gave him a hug when all the dogs died. They were all That's his true. dogs. And he probably needed one. They were his dogs. They were his dogs. Those dogs were really good actors. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That the was best, some good dog work. The first dog, the littlest hobo that ran through the camp in the beginning, he was the star of the movie. His acting was amazing. Yeah, when he enters the pen, yeah. he's doing like the slow crawl, and they got all those dogs to lie down <laughs> and like sleep and stuff, and then he's giving them the shift eye. Yeah, that was great. Good dog work. <laughs> this dog had never done a film before. It was not fully trained. It was actually raised half in the wild. It was a half wolf. Wow. That shot where it walks down the hallway, looks in one door, then goes over to another door where it finds the silhouette of someone. Mm -hmm. They expected that that was just going to be the first take just to set out the blocking. They didn't give the dog any instructions. And the dog just went and did that perfect take. And they're like, we're just going to go run with that. Mm -hmm. That dog just did the best improvisation on this film. Mm -hmm. And that was that silhouette, by the way, was of a crew member who was not one of the actors. And they wanted to psych everyone out with that. Oh, nice. No, that dog. That dog was great. And then, yeah, just getting into the pen. And there's so many of those shots of the dog just sitting there still is the real dog. There was a dummy dog at a later point when it starts to split open, of course. Mm -hmm. But no, yeah, that was a dog that they were just astonished with how well that dog worked. <laughs> About Clark, I love that he's just this kind of lonely guy who just relates to dogs. Mm -hmm. And that alienates him from the others so that everyone is suspicious of him. <laughs> and Richard Mazur's great. He's one of the only actors I recognize. I asked, uh, I was like, oh, it's that guy. And Alex was like, who's that guy? I'm like, I don't know. He plays friends, dads. <laughs> I only recognize Wilford Brimley. And you didn't believe me. <laughs> Did you ever see My Girl? He had a big part in My Girl. Yeah, I've seen My Girl, of course. And read the novelization. <laughs> <laughs> I have that too. Patricia Hermes. Yep. <laughs> Small little geek out there. <laughs> Wilford Brimley is Blair. Oh, he's awesome. God, you gotta love Wilford Brimley. Yep. I love how he just slurs through takes and they leave it and it's beautiful. <laughs> Listen to Mui. Oh, uh, yeah. I actually caught that this time. Yeah. I love yeah. that he's just sitting there with a noose beside him. Yes. He's like, I'm all better now, man. <laughs> I'm fine. I just want to come back inside as the noose is just sitting Yeah. I always have a soft spot for Wilford Brimley because of this and what was that movie? Hard Target. <laughs> uh, see, for me, it's this and the Ewoks adventure. Oh, God. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> Vaguely, that movie. <laughs> I just love that sink of Blair as he realizes the reality of what's going on. Mm -hmm. You can see it all seeping in and it's just overflowing of he doesn't know what to react because he doesn't know who he can trust. And yet you don't know, is that just the thing planning so that it can isolate itself so it can build a new ship? It's very possible. It's the whole question. And the thing is, was he even the thing at that time or was he infected later? You don't know. This film is never going to explain it to you. Nope. And that's what I like about it. That Blair guy's in my favorite scene in the movie. 
Which is? When um, he's freaking out and he's breaking all the radio equipment oh, in yeah. the room. Let's just let Wilford Brimley go crazy with an axe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite part is when Kurt Russell is outside and he hears it going on. And I like when he's running down the hallway. That's mm-hmm. the best. Yeah. And it's all like the sound design where it actually feels like you're there and yeah. it's getting louder and people are like, ah, get out of the way and all that kind of stuff. It was very, very real. I liked it a lot. Mm-hmm. I love that. They did that a few times in the film. The tracking shot of someone coming down a hallway, then cut to their point of view of a tracking shot going down a hallway. Mm-hmm. It's really good. They mm-hmm. did that there. They did that with the doctor in the Norwegian camp as he was walking to the room with the ice block. Mm-hmm. I love those shots. Yeah, why don't we just talk about Richard Dysart as Dr. Cooper, who didn't make it too far until his arms were gone. (laughs) And where is that fellow from? Oh, he does a lot of TV. Yeah, every time, I guess, Alex says every time. I only remember the last time. But this last time where he got his arms taken off, you got a full-on guffaw. (laughs) I was like, what? (laughs) (laughs) They literally built those arms out of jello. And got a double amputee actor who was wearing a Richard Dysart mask. (laughs) Nice. Let's just talk about the Norris heart attack scene. The scene where his chest just suddenly opens up, swallows the doctor's arms, and suddenly this massive creature is erupting out. They're running in with flamethrowers. The head detaches, tries to scurry away. Palmer, who is a thing himself, goes, you gotta be fucking kidding. Maybe it's because (laughs) he didn't realize, hey, I can do that. (laughs) And then they torch the head. It's just one of those scenes where it just keeps going on. It's the most ridiculous of all the scenes, like where they just let their creature effects fly. But it's also one of the most memorable and best. Like the head crab is pretty inspired stuff. Yeah. The head crab is amazing, but the best is watching it slide off the table. Yes. Or like detaches itself from the body and then secretly all like tee hee hee hee. Yeah. (laughs) Because no one can see it happening. Slides off the side of the table. I'm out of here, guys. (laughs) I just also love that shot with the popping of the legs coming out. Julia was telling me, yes, she loves the movie movements of the creatures because it's not quite right because it is like animatronics and natural effects well a lot of it was filmed in reverse too like especially when like tentacles are shooting out they're actually reverses of them pulling in that would make sense yeah it's got that movement that makes it extra scary where it's a familiar movement but in an unfamiliar way so that's what makes it so unnerving yeah and then yeah that they acknowledge the absurdity of it with the you gotta be fucking kidding <laughs> that was one of the best things on the audio commentary with Carpenter's trying to describe the situation Kurt's like no no wait wait for the line wait for the line <laughs> he's so excited to hear it and then it goes on and he's just howling with laughter <laughs> best line in the movie <laughs> that always reminds me of the commentary for Stargate where the directors are just like yeah and then this is happening this time, and then and they go shh 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 and then Kurt Russell goes, like, hey, how you doing? And they just sit there just laughing at their own movie. That's always <laughs> fun in commentaries. I love it when they do that. See, but what's great is that Carpenter is incredibly informative in his commentaries. He goes through so much great detail, like where things are shot. He'll remember dates. He just remembers all these things. And Kurt Russell is not only really just delighting in watching the film again, but he's delighting in hearing all this information. So he'll ask questions and they'll both pause and laugh at things. And you can hear the crack of the beer cans as they're throwing them back. (laughs) It's unfortunate that of their five films together, only three of them have audio commentaries. Someone needs to do a special edition someday of Escape from L.A. And honestly, you need to do a commentary on Elvis. I don't care if that miniseries was a bore to watch. I want to hear that commentary. (laughs) I love that scene of Norris. And I honestly, the Palmer one probably inspired so many drawings as you just the idea of the head splitting open to a mouth. I always forget, actually, that whole bit where he just bounces up to the ceiling for no reason and then comes back down. (laughs) You're staring at him and then suddenly his head is open and the tongue is coming out and pulling you into those teeth. And it's like, holy fuck. Terrifying. And then, Alex, did you catch the reference to the original film there where they set him on fire and he ran out into the snow? Yeah, I caught that reference in the ice block. Oh, you even have the shot of the Norwegian standing around the circle of the saucer. Which was done perfectly. It made it even more terrifying just to be that black and white footage. Though I love how they kind of recreated that here. It's a great scene in the original where they find this craft in the ice and in order to determine what shape it is, they all stand around it and realize that they're standing in a circle. And it's just this great chilling scene. And I actually thought, I don't know if it was conscious or not, but they kind of recreated that here where they all surround bendings in a circle and are just watching their friend burn. This is the first friend to be outed as a thing and they're watching him burn. And it's followed by that great scene with Gary where he's like, but I knew him for 10 years. That wasn't him, Gary. Keith. Freaking David. (laughs) Keith David. Let's talk about Keith freaking David. Who had a broken arm for most of the shoot and is actually wearing a uh, skin-toned cover rubber glove over a cast. (laughs) Nice. 
I didn't even notice it. I love how he's always at odds with everybody. Yeah, his attitude is amazing because he's got that in-your-face kind of thing that I appreciated. There's a great moment during the blood test where it gets down to just him and Gary, and Childs is proven clean, and he just starts freaking out about the fact that he's sitting next to Gary. Yeah, I would. And Gary just has a, such a forlorn look. Cut to Gary sitting alone. <laughs> yeah. Childs is pointing a flamethrower at him now. <laughs> There are so many laughs just due to the editing in this film. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, also during the test, he's testing Nalls. It turns clean. Cut to he's standing there with Nalls next to him with a flamethrower. <laughs> it's just a wonderfully shot scene. Yeah. yeah. It's super dense. I think that's my favorite scene in the movie. I just love Keith David and every single thing he does. Keith David, the voice, and yeah, a great actor on top of that. Mm -hmm. Everything. I don't really have much to say about some of the other actors because they were more smaller roles like Fuchs and Windows. Windows is all right as the freak out guy that everyone yeah. gets to punch at one point or another. Fuchs was more just about Infodome in terms of like the science side. Mm -hmm. Because that, that was actually one of the changes they made from the script was Blair was very open about a lot of what was going on. And here it was Fuchs reading Blair's notes. Right, which is an interesting approach to the Infodump, as you call it. And then there was Bennings, who was the first person to turn into the thing. There's just that great moment where it turns out that the corpse from the Norwegian camp is still alive as Windows just walks in and hears Bennings with tentacles wrapped all around him. That scene was creepy, just because it's in the corner, just kind of slightly happening. Who was the guy that had the heart attack? That was Norris. I really liked Norris when they're turning on the guy with the gun, and then they're trying to decide who's going to be in charge next. He's like, well, I guess it's going to be this guy. He's like, um, yeah, I'm not up for that. Guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that the whole heart problem was something that they did scatter throughout the film in terms of tenseness and pain, and it just kept getting worse as the film went along. Mm -hmm. So it's like by the time he has the heart attack, you're ready for him to have a heart attack, but you're not expecting that it's going to go where it does. Yeah. I just think it's so terrifying when they single out those three guys and they tie them to the chair. Mm -hmm. And then they just decide, let's shoot them up full of morphine. Yeah, just yeah. to shut them up. <laughs> Have you guys ever done morphine, like taken morphine? I don't think no. so. Because I have, and it's messed up. I know. Because I had surgery recently in July. And they give you morphine right after you get out of surgery as your pain reliever. And then mm -hmm. they take you off that and put you off something else. Morphine actually makes you hallucinate. Oh. So my sister, she also had surgery as well, and hers is the most terrifying. She said she hallucinated bugs, specifically spiders, crawling all over the walls and then coming down on top of her. And then she requested not take morphine anymore. And then when, mm. <laughs> when I took it, it's like being um, asleep but awake at the same time. You know, you can hear everything, but you can't really move mm. and you can't really talk. And it's just sort of like a total like chilled out zone, but in a it could go wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> type of way. It sounds a lot like when I used to have night terrors of you are half conscious, but you're also half dreaming. Yeah, or you're like half awake, half not awake. Yeah. And so when I was in the hospital, they had like a, you know, when they pull the fabric around yeah, yeah. the bed. Mm -hmm. Partition type. And so I remember turning to Alex and asking when the kids came in the room, because I saw children playing on the other side of the curtain, but in shadow form. Mm -hmm. I'm like, I didn't know there was kids in here. And Alex just like, uh, what? <laughs> I got the flamethrower. <laughs> yeah. But then I'm like trying to imagine these three guys who are already crazy terrified yeah. and then they're forced to take morphine and sit on a couch together and what kind of crazy things are going on in their mind <laughs> and i have to say that was something that in the script went on a lot longer there was even a whole blackout scene where then they go missing and it turns out that they had just stumbled off to use the bathroom and it was a much longer stretch of the movie that they were all doped up on morphine and I'm kind of glad that they tightened it up. But yeah, it, that's a rather extreme thing to just do to someone. Yeah, just Absolutely. like, uh, roll up your sleeps, guy. Yep. We're going to drug you. <laughs> <laughs> I love how they bring Blair out to the shack and then give him an extra injection before leaving. Yeah. It's like, and then you wonder why he's slurring his words. Everything's kind of a little bit hallucinatory in this movie. Like, there's always someone running off just into the corner of your vision. Mm -hmm. Like, the lights are off. You turn it off in your apartment. They're on again. Who knows what happened in there? One of my favorite scenes was when he approaches a helicopter to see what happened, what the guy did. And there's the tarp. The sound of the tarp, the frozen tarp, makes this kind of like, kind of like sound. It sounded like an alien as well, like the tentacles. There is also the sparking of the electrics in the console, too. Yeah, That's true, yeah, as well. But it all kind of it was this uh, smorgasbord yeah. of scary sounds. God, I just love it. And then, and then the blues and reds. Oh, yeah, like the ice. Uh, you'll have the blue lighting with the red of a flare. A flare, yeah, exactly. Or like when McCready breaks into the room with the dynamite and you first see him 
they use such blue lighting and he's covered with so much frost that you're like, wait, is he an alien? Yeah. And then suddenly you got that red flare against that blue. It's just contrasting that against the kind of stark normalcy of the indoor mm-hmm. set with the harsh white of the outdoors. As is typical with John Carpenter, Dario Argento, that's how you're supposed to do that. <laughs> then there's the dog scene, the dog monster. Oh, yeah. That made me sad. Which, again, just the build of that scene. Mm-hmm. Of just the dog walks in and lays down and everything's normal, but then it's too still. And it's too yeah. quiet. And then all the dogs are starting to notice. And then its head is splitting open and it's turning into this weird <laughs> tongue monster. Spraying them with acid. The shot of that one dog biting through the chain link, yes. trying to get away. That's just Haunting. really powerful. Mm-hmm. Just chewing through metal, just trying to get away from that. A dog leaping out into the guy's arms, essentially. Just seriously, so powerful. There was actually a further subplot with those dogs instead of just regularly killing them off, but I'll get to that in the script. But yeah, and then just the evolution of this is the first time you're seeing a thing in life, and it just keeps changing. It keeps constantly ripping open new things and new things are appearing and suddenly there's these arms reaching up towards the ceiling and then suddenly its side splits open and this flower comes out that Rob Bottin actually said was a flower made of dog tongues and dog teeth. Ooh. The amount of creativity they put into those designs. of They basically just had this young guy who had just previously done a few masks for The Fog, had done some assistant work for Rick Baker on a few other things, and had, actually, I stand correctly, his first big creature effects one was The Howling. And it was based on The Howling that Carpenter gave him this. And basically just said, do with it what you will. And then him and a comic book artist, the guy who created Ghost Rider of all things, <laughs> went off and just came up with these sequences. Because in the script, the transformations are so vague, so loosely described, they're just, they split in tentacles and that's it. And he basically just said, do with it what you will. And then just let me know so I can shoot around it. You know what I really liked about all those weird transformation sequences and everything? Mm -hmm. The fact that at the end, the you fools, this isn't even my final form thing at the end, where it split open and there was another dog skull there, just Mm -hmm. as a way to tie together that even though everything was all separated and everything, it was all still the same thing in the first place. Yeah, and actually the big mouth on the side of its head was actually what Palmer's head had turned into. Mm -hmm. One of the arms was what Benning's arm was, which is weird because all those things did die. Yeah, but it also tied together that as separate as all they were, they were all still the same thing. Yeah, I just, the climax, my only main problem with the climax is, wait, where do they suddenly get this ice cave, which had no previous established? And that was simply because they needed a set that they could easily replicate for a stop motion miniature. Well, wasn't that where the generator was? The generator would typically just be out in a shack. It would just have its own shack. It wouldn't be built in this giant hollowed out, almost looking like a mine shaft. Mm. Yeah, no, I love that line of, the generator's gone. Can we fix it? No, you don't understand. It's gone. (laughs) (laughs) I did love that. The puppet of the final thing, it just didn't do a whole lot for me. It felt a little too much like they were just trying to squeeze everything in instead of doing a full design of of its own. But again, I'm not saying that ruins the movie at all. It just feels like they had spent so much of this movie pouring everything out. And by the time they got to that last bit, they're kind of just like, we don't have anything left. (laughs) I mean, it's so brief. It's not like it ruins anything. It's a perfectly acceptable ending. And then you get the final scene with Childs and all that afterwards. Am I alone in having a little, like, just a slight hair of an issue with that climax? No, that's totally fine. It just doesn't bother me at all. But I can see what you're saying. It isn't incredibly imaginative. It's sort of like a sandworm. I do like all the haunted house stuff. Like, suddenly you get the floorboards ripping across, you know. Well, that part was great just because it comes so quickly. Just such uh, tight cuts. It's great. And they did actually have a lot more stop motion in that sequence. And they still have some of that footage on the DVD. Carpenter didn't like the way it was shot in frame, so he ultimately just didn't use it. And the stop motion was by a bunch of the guys who worked on Nightmare Before Christmas and worked on Dreamscape and Elm Street 3. Cool. It was good stop motion. It just it wasn't shot very well, so I can see why he didn't use it. It was just kind of like a very flat composition. Mm. So much fire in this movie. Oh, yeah, it's great. And I think they should have started with the generator room when they started blowing things up. Yeah. It's weird that they started with that spaceship, no? When they blew it up? No, no, like the very beginning of the movie is like a shot of a spaceship going on to Earth. Oh, yeah. I noticed that as well. I'm like... It's the same opening shot as Predator. It is exactly the same opening shot, but I forget it happens every time. And I'm like, that's so weird. Like, did they add that later? It doesn't seem like it's necessary. Because that's 100,000 years in the past. Exactly. Actually, and if you notice, the Earth is actually almost covered with ice, so it's like the Ice Age. I did not notice that, but that's very cool. But yeah, you're right. That's totally unnecessary. (laughs) 
And then I love, though, for the title of the movie, they actually did the exact same effect that they did for the title of the 1951 version, where you have the stencil of the thing, and then you stretch a garbage bag over it and use a heat lamp to melt the garbage bag from behind. Huh. I didn't know that. Which gradually reveals the title. It's such a killer title, like so memorable that I understand completely why they did it. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have any final thoughts they want to add on the film in general? Do you guys think Childs was infected? I have no idea what to think with this. This is like watching Hannibal. They're so far ahead of me, I don't even try to second guess it. <laughs> I played a bit of the game when that came out in 2001, so I don't know if that's considered canon or not. So I just no. know what the game said happened. Yeah, later comics do that too. The comics actually do bring the thing back to the mainland and it starts the widespread. So that's actually pretty neat. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Which is honestly, I'll be getting back into the prequel. That's actually one of my disappointments is I would actually love to see a movie that just explores, no, what actually would happen if that made it to mainland. I would actually like to see a point of view from the thing where one of the main characters is themselves the thing and most of Earth has been taken over. And it's the thing basically having to come to grips with its now lost humanity or something like that hmm. as they're weeding out the last of the resistance or something. You could do an interesting story there as it's become this dark mimicry failed parrot of a society. Very cool. I don't know, but I've been thinking about this series a lot for like 20 <laughs> years of my life. You've been living with this for years. <laughs> so that's probably why I'm a little like, really, you're just going to do it in the Arctic again? <laughs> yeah. Next time in the tropics. Which, again, is one of the comics. They go to the rainforest. There you go. I think they could have solved a lot of issues. I think if Blair got his way, he was the craziest, but he was also kind of the smartest when he first tried to start killing everyone off. I'm like, maybe they all should have died in the beginning. <laughs> he would have yeah. saved a lot of trouble. Well, yeah, he stranded everybody, which was the smartest move, even if he went batshit crazy. Yeah. It's the smartest move both ways. It's a smart move as a thing, because it then locks everyone in with you, but it's a smart move as a human because it locks in the thing. There's such dual motivations. It's true. I can pinpoint the one moment where they could have solved everything and stopped the movie was when they burned the blood packs and everyone is outside by that fire. If everyone just stuck a pinky into that fire, they could have found out exactly who the thing was, dealt with it right then and there. <laughs> no, because that pinky is still attached to them, so they still have control over it. Once that blood is separated from them, they no longer have control over it. It then becomes a reactionary cellular organism. I just love that the blood test scene is so iconic and so influential that it even made it into Star Trek. Yeah, I don't think there's a single sci-fi show out there that doesn't have a Thing episode. <laughs> X-Files has a Thing episode, this has a Thing episode. And sometimes in terms of the imitation capacity, but also just in terms of you have your episode where you're isolated in a frozen locale and tensions blowing. Deep Space Nine even went so far as to have the blood test, which was great. Is that part of the Dominion War? Who are the shapeshifters, yeah. Does Cisco say fuck you too to somebody in that episode? Because I will watch that. <laughs> he all but says it. <laughs> oh, just go quick around. Alex, in summation, final thoughts. Fantastic movie. I love it. Got nothing bad to say. Julia? I think that this is a really great movie on two levels for people. Well, more than two levels, but I'm going to only say two. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful, as Noel was talking about earlier, entry film for horror movies. Because I really don't know horror movies. I don't watch horror movies, and I never did. So watching this movie with Alex was one of the first horror movies I ever saw as well. Granted, a lot later in life than Noel, but <laughs> it was one of the first ones. And it has such a wonderful structure to it, and it has such a great... Um, you don't have to know anything. I think when you watch a lot mm -hmm. of other horror movies, you have to have all this backstory and know how it works and the timing and, well, this is because of this or whatever it is, or that's not the way the killers work mm -hmm. or because you, you know all the nuances in the way horror works. This is like a completely different... It's in a more of a thriller genre, but with all of these really great, gory things that if you hadn't watched horror movies before, you never would have seen before. And they're so, like, mind-blowing to see even <laughs> now. So much later that they still really hold up. So I highly recommend it not only to people who like just regular movies, <laughs> <laughs> but also for people who like dramas, for people who like thrillers, for people who like mysteries. It's got all of that stuff in it, which is just really great. I'm just so happy to be able to watch something like this. We've watched so many movies that I've had to kind of like like bits of or see the best of. Yeah, I know. We've had a few episodes here where you really haven't gotten into them, and I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, and it's just so nice <laughs> <laughs> to be able to be like, I knew that I was going to like it because I liked it before, but to be reassured and watch it again for mm -hmm. the third time, and it's it just as good. Up. Yeah, doesn't it's, let you It's down. just so wonderful. I'm changing my final thoughts to hers. <laughs>
Kevin? I don't know if you've been able to hear, but my cats have been fighting for the last five minutes. No. And I think that kind of sums up my thoughts on the movie. Is one called Childs and the other McCready? No. It's very intense, very noisy, and you keep going back to it every once in a while. <laughs> it's not exactly a perfect metaphor. I just, no, it's uh, <laughs> such an iconic movie, and I can go on and on and on about how it's influential and how you need to see it from an academic standpoint, you need to see it, but that kind of almost even cheapens the movie because you have to see it as a movie standpoint. You have to let it stand on its own as a story, and it really, really does. It's just everything comes together so perfectly and makes something beautiful, grotesquely, glisteningly, gooey, fun times, beautiful. And that's everything all together. And it's a wonderful movie. It's a delight to watch, even if you don't like horror. And to build on that point, it's one of those movies, you can throw things at it from every conceivable angle and it'll still hold up. You can look at it as a horror movie, and it's a spectacular horror movie. You can look at it as a science fiction movie. It is a spectacular science fiction movie. You can look at it as a character drama. It is a spectacular character drama. As a thriller, it is a spectacular thriller. As an intellectual movie, it is a spectacular intellectual movie. As popcorn entertainment, it is spectacular popcorn entertainment. As something for someone who would never, ever go see a movie of this type, this might be the one for them. For someone who absolutely loves movies of this type, this is probably their favorite. It is one of those films that every angle you come at it, it holds up as an amazing film. And if that doesn't mark it as a masterpiece, I don't know what does. I'm just going to go ahead and ask you guys, Alex and Julia, is this Carpenter's best film to date that we've covered so far? Yes. 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 See, that's what I figured it was going to be, and I'm, I'm glad that it's held up to that. I still say Assault on Precinct 13. That and Someone's Watching Me, those two are just such great movies. And this one, it's not that they're not as great. This one's just greater. Mm -hmm. Those two are definitely a very close second. I still don't even know which of those two I would put above the other. <laughs> then bringing us back onto the sad somber note, this really, really, really massively hurt John Carpenter's career and led to some very unfortunate choices and circumstances. And this was his first big studio movie. And because of how this performed, he didn't get to make many more studio movies. He had to do a lot of things on the cheap. He had to cut a lot of corners. He had to kind of compromise things. And we shall see. But I think this is the peak that we are going to reach on Masters of Carpentry. I think we have trudged uphill, a jagged uphill. And now <laughs> we begin the slow descend down the other side. You heard it here first. It's all downhill from <laughs> here on Masters of Carpentry. <laughs> yes, which, again, not to say that some of his upcoming films aren't really good films, but he never again made, from my memory, made anything like the thing. And I think it helped that he had a studio that was so confident in him that they just gave him free reign and a lot of resources and a cast and crew who were eager and brought through a game and were excited. And because of the reputation that this film's failure brought, he never got that again. He never got that level of support. He never got that level of camaraderie. I mean, as we've pointed out in the credits, he's still working with a lot of the same people he's worked with on multiple films, and they're all about to go away. Mm -hmm. And so all of those close bonds and friendships and relationships and camaraderie, that's going to go away. That's a bummer. I think, though, the ending to this movie is apt, though, of we see our fate. Let's just face it head on. Have a drink. He never gave up making films until the last decade. <laughs> yes, yeah, so I shouldn't say never. It took a long time before he gave up on making films. He's a rock star now. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's got the album out. Yeah, it just released an album. That's not going to really move many units, but it's still pretty cool. Hey, it's on vinyl. There you go. I listened to that first song, and holy crap, is that a good song? Yeah. Oh, it's awesome. John Carpenter, I wish that he could have had more of a career like The Thing and like Assault on Precinct 13 and like Someone's Watching. Where would we have gone had the studio actually stuck behind him and said, okay, we'll just go ahead and let him do Firestart or we'll see how it goes? Would that have taken him off and rebuilt what he lost here? Do you read Sutter Kane? We'll get to In the, in the Mouth of Madness is a very different thing. <laughs> so not to end this on a somber note, but granted, the thing ended us on a very somber note. <laughs> bow, bow. <laughs> yes. So anyways, if you guys can bear with me for about another 2,020 words, let me just go ahead and just run through really quick the screenplay. I've got the second draft of Bill Lancaster's screenplay, uh, dated March 4th, 1981. It is a good read and definitely has me eager to read his Firestarter draft. 
There's a lot of little differences. The odd line here and there are a few things that were reordered. The character of Windows is here called Sanchez and has a few lines in Spanish. McCready has an ongoing relationship with an inflatable doll. I'm not joking. And as I mentioned before, the thing descriptions are very vague. It's like just a spider leg here or talons here. It's basically like things explode out of it and it just doesn't really describe what things because they knew they were going to work on that later. So just focusing on some of the big changes. The first is Benning's death. Bennings, again, is the guy who was wrapped in the tentacles, who then they burnt in the middle of the field. It's discovered that three of the surviving dogs have broken loose from the kennel and fled into the wastelands, and it's believed one or all of them could have become the thing from swallowing pieces of the monster during the monster dog attack. So Childs, McCready, and Bennings set out on snowmobiles to track them down. First, they find half of one of the dogs mostly eaten and theorize that the other half is being saved for later. They come to a frozen lake where one of the remaining dogs is quietly munching on what's left. As Childs and McCready approach to torch it, the third dog, fully transformed into a thing, comes up out of the snow from behind and drags down Bennings. The two don't know what to torch first, as the eating dog also starts to transform, so they go ahead and torch that one, and then when it's realized that Bennings is too far enmeshed into the other thing, and it's a lot like that twisted face thing at the Norwegian camp where he's like half merged into it, McCready and Childs ultimately just turn their torches on him and fire. I'm guessing that this one was probably changed just for the budgetary reasons of bringing a puppet out into the actual locations, so they wanted to just tighten that up a bit. In terms of Fuchs being gone, Fuchs was the one who they find his burned body where he lit himself on fire with a flare. Instead, there's the whole blackout and he goes missing. Childs has been established as having a greenhouse full of marijuana plants, and Alex, in a scene echoing the 1951 movie, him and Palmer find that the greenhouse had been breached by someone causing the plants to frost over. Palmer suddenly panics, thinking all of the marijuana themselves might be things, and starts lighting them on fire. And as they're fighting, they find Fuchs dead, nailed to the back of the door in the script with an axe, but there's actually some production photos where he's been stabbed there with a shovel. Hmm. When Norris, after his heart attack, begins to transform, he merely knocks Dr. Cooper out of the way instead of biting off his arms, and Cooper actually survives the scene. And instead of his head rolling off, he squirts out like a wad of pus that tries to wriggle away, and McCready sees that, and that's where he gets the idea for the uh, blood test. And then the Palmer attack is largely the same, except then Dr. Cooper is killed instead of Windows. The third act is very different, and we got a little bit to run through here. After discovering Blair's ruse and the partially assembled ship, the surviving group, which is everyone in the film plus Windows, though Childs has already gone missing, decides to hole up in the generator shack, armed with dynamite and cyanide capsules, as they try to lure the thing into a trap by wiring high-voltage cable to the door. Again, another reference to the old film. The thing cuts off Nalls and windows in the kitchen, and they ready their torches as they see Talon starting to saw through the door, but they don't realize another arm is starting to slowly reach into the door behind them, and it grabs Windows, who instantly bites his cyanide capsule and dies. And the thing is massive and on the roof, and the ceiling starts to cave in, so Nalls, who's wearing his roller skates, takes off down the hall as the ceiling is rippling behind him and thing arms and tentacles are punching through the walls behind him. And they all gather into the room rigged with the wire door trap, waiting in silence as they just hear a litany of sounds outside. You know, like opening and closing doors, mewling and squishes. Something starts knocking on the door and asking them to come out. And then suddenly the ceiling opens up and the thing, a massive ball of limbs and everything, just drops into the middle of the room. Gary is speared by a tongue and ends up falling into the electric trap himself. McCready retreats. Nalls has a broken leg and drags himself down the hall. And this is incredibly sad. The thing quietly following him. So Nalls pulls himself into a bathroom stall with it playfully scratching at the door as he rips a piece of wood out of the wall and slits his own throat. Yikes. Yeah. So McCready hops into one of the tractors and just starts tearing down the entire compound by just rolling over it. And he's described as covered in frostbite by this point, the blackened marks looking like war paint, as he drinks and rants and smashes in room after room. And it's finally just him and the thing as the Blair thing closes in, only for him to dive out of the tractor revealing a stick of lit dynamite and two hydrogen tanks as it explodes. And then you get the final scene between him and Childs. So that's the entire third act that I'm guessing they just, they had to restage just because they couldn't get all the puppetry on location and they had the idea of, let's create a new set so we can do all the stop motion effects. 
It's very interesting to hear this. Like, I never would even consider a different take on the ending, so it's very cool to hear. There was actually a scene that was storyboarded for Nalls' death in the final film, where it's the thing creature, like, springs out of a box and grabs him, and it was just decided, let's just have him disappear. I love this film. Like, Fuchs just disappears, and they just find this torched corpse. Mm -hmm. Nalls just disappears. Childs just disappears, you know? I love it when horror movies, you don't need to show the kill. Just show someone disappear. If they did a sequel, they could have just had someone finding the frozen body of Nalls and he could have been a thing. Yeah. And again, that kind of brings up Halloween 2, where it was like people at the hospital just start disappearing. Mm hmm So anyways, the novelization by Alan Dean Foster is adapted from this draft of the script, so all of those differences are, are intact. The one exception being that the character Sanchez, still not yet Windows, has instead been renamed Sanders, though he does still have a bunch of lines in Spanish. I don't really recommend the book. It's not terrible. Foster's prose is very nice, but it is very dull at times because he didn't benefit from all of the characterization that the actors built on set. And he had none of the knowledge of what the actual thing transformations were. He's just stuck with the vague descriptions in the script. And so he keeps it vague in the book. This is further heightened by the fact that Alan Dean Foster, one of his main problems as a novelizationist is he doesn't describe characters. He doesn't describe what they look like. He rarely gets into their heads. And I don't know if part of that's just because they don't give him info on who's playing the roles, or he's just worried about contradicting what they look like, or if he's even just like, well, the audience is going to know who's playing those roles anyway, so they can bring that in. But it makes for a very dull book. It's not fun. I mean, like, you get little bits like Norris is an oil man whose experiments have stalled, so he's just been helping out the other people with their weather stuff. Childs is from Detroit. Otherwise, it's not that good. It's just flat and bland and dull. And then we get to the, the original 1938 novella, Who Goes There? Which I did bring up part of in our episode on the 1951 thing from Another World. This was published right near the end of John W. Campbell Jr.'s decade of writing before he settled in full-time as the editor of the science fiction mag Astounding. Most of his output was space opera fantasy adventures, but under the name Don A. Stewart, he published darker stories exploring the horror side of science fiction, and Who Goes There was one such book. It is often heralded as one of the top novellas of the period. The Antarctic Outpost is now populated by a whopping 37 people, among whom are most of the cast of the John Carpenter version in name, if not always in persona. The lead is still McCready though here he's a meteorologist and second-in-command, and this kind of references to something that Kevin said earlier on. In this version, he is the noble, clear-headed leader type whom everyone trusts and goes to for advice, and is basically Doc Savage as he's described as a massive six-foot-five brawny man of bronze, with bronze skin and bronze hair, a bronze beard, and even a bronze smile. Yeah, we're glad they didn't go that route. Yeah. So you've also got Blair as the biologist, Gary as the station commander, Clark as the dog keeper, and Dr. Cooper. Norris is there too, but he's now staged as the opposing viewpoint to Blair, at least at first as he wanted to destroy the creature they found in the ice while Blair wanted to preserve it. As mentioned in that previous episode, the first five chapters of the novella roughly make up the plot of the 1951 film. They find a ship in ice, accidentally destroy it with thermite, bring back a block containing an intact specimen, often just called The Thing which they thaw out. It turns out to be alive and fleas, attacking their dogs before they put it down with a cable of high-voltage electricity that they've tied onto the end of an axe handle. And that kind of becomes one of their main weapons throughout. Chapter 6 opens with them opening up the smoking remains and discovering that an imitation was internally being built out of the dog the thing was eating. Blair explains his hypothesis about how the thing works, including that it can read and imitate a person's mind so perfectly that it might even forget that it's a thing as that persona goes dormant in the subconscious. As he goes along, Blair starts breaking into madness and finally reveals that he's already smashed all the radios and vehicle engines because one or more of the group may themselves be things, and they're the only ones around for 400 miles, so there's really nowhere for it to go. And surprisingly, the rest of the group accepts this and nobly smashes everything that he's missed, even as Blair is doped up on morphine and tucked away in a shack. So as paranoia and speculation set in, most of it focused on Conant, the one who was guarding the block of ice by himself when the thing emerged, Copper devises a serum test involving the cattle and remaining dogs. It seems to clear everybody, but then it's discovered that some of the dogs had been infected by thing tissues from the earlier attack when they bit into it, with cows and dogs being discovered as they try to slither under the bars in half-transformed forms. And suspicion is now thrown on Copper and Gary due to the bungled test results. 
so those two are tied to bunks and sedated with morphine, while everyone else tries to think of a solution. And I will say, Julia, the novella really does get into their morphine hallucinating state a lot, in terms of they are just babbling and nonsensical and nobody can understand them for a good half the story. It's messed up, man. So all of the remaining men try to relax by watching a movie, ignoring the cook Kinner who's fallen into paranoid gibberish in the corner. When everyone realizes he's gone quiet, they discover that his throat has been slashed. McCready just decides to play it safe. He'll give the body a prod with electricity just to be sure, but the corpse, before he can, erupts into another thing and starts attacking. The descriptions of the transformations are very vague, often using the word melting as aspects of the creature revert to primordial jelly before reshaping and solidifying a new form. So I imagine it, Kevin, kind of being a bit like the Dominion transformations. Mm -hmm. Very liquidy, they turn into like an amber-like fluid before they form their new shapes. Lots of scales and teeth. I think one of the later ones that you're describing is to have four tentacle arms, but otherwise it really just doesn't get much into detail. So they shock the creature to death, using acid droppers to take out what bits of blood were spilled that are squirming around on the floor. It's kind of a funny scene. But this is where McCready gets his idea for the test. Sidebar to say that Clark is the one who sheepishly admits to having been the one to cut Kinner's throat because he couldn't stand the guy's ranting hysterics. <laughs> and the others congratulate him for proving he's not a monster by doing something so horrifically human. <laughs> So Clark, instead of being the red herring, is the one who's now guilty of accidentally murdering someone. So as with the movie, everyone's thumbs are cut and hot wires are dipped in. A man named Dutton is the first one revealed, pouncing even before the test can be performed. He's zapped. Conant, who was cleared by the first test, is the next to be revealed and shocked, immediately followed by Gary. In the end, 14 of them turn out to have been things, bringing the population of the base down from 37 to 23. A huge bonfire is built to completely burn the bodies and has decided to finally test Blair. While hiking out to his shack, they see an albatross flying in and do their best to either kill it or chase it away, while also worrying, can that bird maybe be one of the things? They never find out. Arriving at the shack, they find Blair fully transformed. He eats the hands of a man named Barclay, but is put down by McCready's blowtorch. The creature tries to run out into the snow and McCready just follows him, just keeps blowing him with flame after flame after flame until it collapses. So it's, again, very much evocative of that image in both the original film and this one of the thing running out a door just out into the snow while lit a fire. They discover that he had spent the last few days using all of the smashed electronics to build an anti-gravity harness largely out of food cans that he was going to use to float away to the mainland. And the remaining characters take in their victory and wonder how they're going to explain it all come summer. It's a really good novella. The characters are thin. The Thing transformations are very loose. There's not much to them. But it is so high concept and smart as it really thinks through every angle. It even goes beyond the movie in terms of the Thing is telepathic. So not only can it read a person's mind in order to get their memories and react accordingly, but it's also reading the minds of everyone else around it. So anytime you come up with a solution to defeat the Thing, it's coming up with counter solutions. The blood test is kind of its last foil because how do you counter that? It's like, once you take my blood away from me, I can't prevent it from reacting. So that's why it's even trying to attack before the test can be performed. It's good, and it, it's still a fascinating novella just to see how two very different interpretations both came out of the book. The 1951 one from the first five chapters, Carpenter's from the remaining two-thirds or three-quarters of the novella. It's a very good read, and if you're a fan of the thing, it's absolutely worth tracking down. I think the Carpenter film is a better version of the story, but it's still really neat to see its origins, and it's still a really good read in its own right. Cool. And then finally, we have Brain Stealers of Mars. It was an earlier story that John W. Campbell wrote in 1936, where it's basically the same concept, but played as a comedy. Huh. Where two guys land on Mars in their rocket, are going around getting samples of the foliage, until they realize that some of the trees and bushes are Earth trees and bushes. And wait, why does that tree suddenly look like me? Why does that tree suddenly look like you, but is talking like me? And they realize that basically there's a life form on Mars that just parrots things. And it's parroting not only them, but memories that they have. And then suddenly all these alien creatures come out and try to actually stage diplomatic negotiations. But it turns out that this entire society that they're meeting is just made up from their own imagination. And from like their own childhood memories of like, that was like a Wizard of Oz book that I read, you know, and stuff like that. So they try to leave the planet while also trying to figure out which one of the various versions of them standing around is actually them. And two of the guys get back to the ship and think that they're fine, but they're still like in a standoff. Is like, I don't know if you're you. You don't know if I'm me. 
one guy proves it by drawing his gun and firing because while they can replicate the image of a gun, they can't replicate the mechanics of it. And the other guy sneezes. And so his friend is like, you might know what the image of a sneeze is, but the actual muscles and stuff involved in the human body in a sneeze are so complicated, there's no way you could have faked that. So I accept that you're human. So he turns back to the controls and they fly off to Earth while the thing behind him is marveling at this new lesson that it's learned in these new muscles that it just grew. Hmm. So that's basically the story of Brain Stealers of Mars, which was kind of like an early draft of what would become Who Goes There. So that is everything that I've written. I managed to get through it all. Impressive. So any final thoughts on the entire experience that has been the thing? <laughs> or are we ready to just call it a night? I think I'm good. Thank you, Alex and Julia, as always. You're Thank most you. Welcome. Thank you again, Kevin, for joining us. Always. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> we shall have you back again for, I believe, Big Trouble in Little China. Yes, I've been looking forward to that. <laughs> a few months from now. We've got a few things here and there, but I am so looking forward to that. That's, again, oh, another film. Oh, my God. I have avoided most of John Carpenter's movies over the course of this project because I just want to kind of come into them in order and fresh. Big Trouble in Little China has been, I've watched on TV three times in the last few months just because it's on TV a lot and I can't avoid it. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm not complaining. <laughs> so That kind of is the microcosm of everybody's Big Trouble in Little China experience is that you can't really avoid it. It's there. It's awesome. It's there and I'm not turning the channel. Yeah, you don't actually <laughs> go out thinking, hey, I'm going to go watch Big Trouble in Little China today. It just sort of happens. Yes. And you're okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways. Masters of Carpentry can be found at mastersofcarpentry.blogspot.com and is in no way affiliated with John Carpenter or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Our theme music is Black Rainbow by Jack Locke. To hear more, please visit jacklock.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. And then there's the thing video game, which I've never played. And I'll just... I, I really it. wanted to. I started it and then I had to give because I was working at GameStop at the time. And so what they were doing was if you were working there, you could check certain games out like a library. The reason being so that you could be knowledgeable about them. So I checked it out and I played a little bit of it and then I gave it back and then I never really continued with it. It looked pretty much just like a Half-Life clone. Yeah, but John Carpenter did some voice acting. He played a doctor. Then there was the Kurt Russell character. It took place like three months after the end of the movie. I've seen Spoonie did a whole thing on it. Okay. It was interesting, but I never really continued with it. That's why I'm, I'm glad that there aren't too many games involved in all this franchise stuff, because I can't say anything about them on the show. <laughs> <laughs> Buy a PlayStation 1. We never mentioned T.K. Carter as Nalls on his roller skates. <laughs> he was from Good Morning Miss Bliss. Aww.